Praise be Jesus Christ. I'd like to start this lesson off with um, a prayer from the Oratory Place of Prayer. And this is found on page 27. It's the act of charity. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Oh my God, I love you above all things, with my whole heart and soul, because you are infinitely good and deserving of all my love. I love my neighbor as myself for love of you. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This uh, act of charity is, is a great prayer to, um, to memorize, but also to just tie into the gospel which, uh, which this lesson is on. And this gospel is taken from uh, Matthew twenty two thirty four 34 through 40. So I'd like to go ahead and start off um, with this gospel. When the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a scholar of the law, tested him by asking, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to, them, he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the greatest and the first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. The whole law and the prophets depend on these two commandments. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. So as we start this, um, as we start this lesson, first we just want to like you know identify what are we talking about when we when we talk about law. Um, teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Now, the Jewish people had several laws, hundreds and hundreds of laws, uh, things for ritual cleaning and, and laws for the Sabbath. Um, but, of course, also they had the laws that were given to them by Moses, that God gave to Moses, that Moses gave to the people. And so we're going to work off of the, that set of laws, those ten laws, and then the, the assumption, okay, well, which of these laws is the greatest? So let's first just go ahead and walk through something that should be familiar to us, and that is the Ten Commandments. So if we walk through these, okay, the, um, we're going to go ahead and first just kind of draw a line because there's two, the two uh, tablets that Moses had, uh, the one with uh, the love of God and then the other with the love of neighbor. So the love of neighbor would entail, and this, this also is connected to the gospel, if you remember the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes up to Jesus and says, good teacher. What must I uh, do to have eternal life? And, and then Jesus proceeds to, um, to list the commandments. Um, and actually he lists number 4 through, through 8, but implied in 4 through 8 is also 9 and 10. We'll see that in just a second. And, and the young man says, I have done all of these. Even since my youth, I have done all these. And then Jesus responds, but one thing is lacking. And what was lacking in that rich young ruler, which is also then we can kind of tie that into the gospel today, is, is the love of God was lacking. The rich young ruler in the gospel was able to love his neighbor, but he was lacking in his love of God. And we'll talk about why that would be. So the, the, the fourth commandment is the love of father and mother. The fifth commandment is thou shalt not kill. The sixth is adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Uh, the seventh is thou shalt not steal. The eighth, thou shalt not lie or bear false witness. And then we see that uh, number six and nine go together. This is not to covet your neighbor's spouse. And seven and ten go together, not to covet your neighbor's goods. And then when we move up to uh, the, the other three, we have... Um, have no other gods before me. Um, do not take the Lord's name in vain. And then the third, the Sabbath. Keep holy the Sabbath. Now when we look at these, we see that this is what Jesus is talking about. The love of God. And this is love of neighbor. And with that, and we, we say that all of this then is summed up. All of the prophets and all of the law 
And this where where really when we look at the prophets and the law, how important this was to the Jewish people. Because the law, which was given to them by Moses, um, what was, was kind of the black and white, this is what to do. And then, of course, there were other laws um, implied in that as well. But then also we have the prophets, which are that constant voice of truth. Um, when, the, when the Israelites had strayed away, it would be the prophet that would bring them back. So they always had the law as that standard. But in addition, through the mercy of God, God would not just give them the law, but he would also give them that voice of truth. Um, this is very similar to the church now, where we do have our doctrine, and we do have our morals, and we do have things that are definitely set, our dogma, our doctrine, and faith and morals, but also we have the voice of the saints. We have a voice of a Mother Teresa. We have the voice of a, a St. John Paul too, and, and we have these prophets that are kind of calling us back to the moral life. So Jesus, when he says that these two commandments, the love of God and the love of ma- neighbor, they are all summed up. It's the fullness of both the law and the prophets. So the whole of the law and the prophets, the whole of the law and the whole of the prophets depend on these two commandments. Now that's a very big statement to make uh, to, to the Pharisees. Now the Sadducees had already, already been silenced by Jesus. And so now, as we see, this is, this is the gospel that's coming right after um, when the Pharisees and the Herodians, um, last week's gospel, the Pharisees and the Herodians had, had teamed up to try to stump Jesus and to try to trick him. And, and so what happens is they say, they give him a coin and they say, should we, should we uh, or they ask him, should we pay taxes? And he says, well, give me the coin. And he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and, and render to God what is God. Give to Caesar what is Caesar, give to God what is God's. And so now we see in this gospel that they're continuing to trap Jesus and to ensnare him in their traps. And, um, and now, since the, Sad- Her- the Herodians had tried, the Pharisees had tried, the Sadducees had tried, and it says in this gospel that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, and now the, the Pharisees are going to um, take another stab at Jesus. And um, it's to my understanding that this is the, the kind of the last encounter uh, of, of, of trickery that they try to do. And, and then he'll move on to Calvary after this. So with this, they don't succeed. Um, just as the Herodians were silenced, the Sadducees were silenced, now the Pharisees are also silenced. No one is able to trick the truth. Jesus Christ is the truth, and he cannot be deceived. Uh, we know that God is true, and he cannot deceive, and he will not be deceived. So this is a, another example of that. But with that, this is a big statement that these two commandments, love of God and love of neighbor, they, they, um, they cover the entirety, the whole of the prophets and, um, and the law. And why is that? Um, that's, that's really because we have to see that what's the purpose of these ten? The, in other words, they're a means. Did the Ten Commandments come in the garden with Adam and Eve? Were they given? Were those tablets given to Adam and Eve? Were they given to Abraham? Were they given to Noah? They weren't. Um, these, these commandments were given to Moses. And they were given at a particular time. And they were given at a time where the people needed them. Um, they, they, were, they weren't given prior. And, and so what we see is that they were a means to something. Now what will happen is, and this is true, that we could, um, we could use the Ten Commandments as an end in and of themselves. And we could go through and we could do all of these perfectly. But what would that mean to us? Um, If I were to accomplish every single one of these commandments perfectly, um, would would that be my end? Would that be, would I be done? And the answer is no. The Ten Commandments are are a, a, a gift to us. They're a grace, a law given to us. But the means, um, they're just a means to our end. And so we need to look at, at two scripture verses here to, to kind of find out, okay, then what is the purpose of the law? Okay, and the first one is 1 Timothy 1, five, And we'll look at that. And then also Romans 10.4. Okay, we'll look at uh, Romans 10.4 first. Uh, in this, in this um, scripture... 
It says, for the end of the law is Christ, okay, unto justice to everyone that believeth. So the end, the whole purpose of this law is Jesus Christ. That's the reason we have the law. Um, this becomes even more clear when we look at uh, Timothy. So in Timothy, and this is Timothy 1.5, um, it says, Now the end of the commandment is charity from a pure heart in a good conscience in an unfeigned faith. So the end of the law is Christ and charity. Now we know that Christ is God and God is love. So these two things are obviously connected, Christ and charity. And this really is our goal. Our goal is not, I, I think you'll agree with me here, that you could do all of these perfectly and still be a very unloving person. We have seen people that have put God first and that have never spoken, uh, said a swear word or spoken His name in vain. Um, we have seen people that have gone to Mass every Sunday have honored their father, haven't killed anyone, etc., etc., but yet they weren't loving. They didn't have charity in them. And maybe even you could say that, that, they, that they weren't mirroring or imitating Christ. So it's very important to realize that all of these things should help us to, to have Christ-centered, to have Christ more in our life, to imitate Christ, and to be charitable. Um, I think it's important to, to just look a little bit more at Timothy 1.5 where it'll say, now the end of the commandment is charity. And, and how, are, how do we have that charity? And we're given three ways. From a pure heart, a good conscience, and then an unfeigned faith. And here I'm going to use the Latin instead of, of the English here. Because in the Latin it says, fide non ficta. If we look at that word right there, non ficta, uh, that, that reminds us of, of probably, it looks very familiar, non fiction. Okay? Not false. Something that would be, um, you know, obviously a true, like a biography or, or something like that. So, fide non ficta means faith, okay, without falsehood. It's important to kind of say, okay, what is charity? A lot of times we don't even use that word charity. Instead, what we use is the word love. Okay, so let's just put that in here for a second. And we get lost in that definition of love. What is love or what is charity? We just, before this lesson, prayed the act of charity. And if love, um, if we get to think that love is just feelings, sentimentality, uh, emotion, well, we really miss what love is because love... Where, where does love come from, or what, what is characterized? We're charitable, okay, and we practice this charity when we have a pure heart. What's my intention? Because can I say I'm really loving if my intention is not in purity, if I don't have that pure heart? We remember the Beatitudes. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God, correct? So if I'm charitable, then I will see clearly Christ in others and Christ in myself, um, Okay. I have to have a good conscience. Um, I can't be have any duplicity in, in me that I am saying one thing and then living another, but there has to be um, a good conscience. In other words, I, I know that I'm doing the right thing. And then, very important, then we tie into the doctrine, the truth, right? That I have to have a faith that's without falsehood. I can't let the doctrinal errors uh, creep in. I have to be very clear about the faith. So when we have a very clear faith, truth, all right, um, goodness, and this purity, okay? So we can even kind of say that this would be a beauty, that this would be a goodness, and that this would be truth. Okay, some of the transcendental, transcendentals, right? That we have uh, what's, what is good, what is true, and what is beautiful. A pure heart, a good conscience, and a faith without falsehood. Um, this is what love is. This is what charity is. It's not a feeling, it's not a sentimentality, but, but this true charity. And that is our end. 
That is our end. We want to grow closer and closer to having a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sure faith, a lively faith that is, is correct. Um, and that's what Christ gives us. Christ is, is the means to give us all this. Why? Because He is the truth, right? Um, he, he is the truth. He is the way. And He is the life. And he's not just a way or points to a truth, but He is actually the truth. So we look at this. This is our end. When we begin to treat this as our end, then, then we're off base. This is our means to get to this. Um, now it's interesting because we, we kind of start here and we say, okay, um, I'm going to do all these things and hopefully, hopefully, God willing, by doing these things, I will become more pure, more good, more truthful, all right? Through doing these things, I will become closer to Christ, but it also works the other way. How, and I'm, how am I able to do these things? I can't accomplish the law without what? I can't accomplish the law without Christ, without His grace. So in other words, these are a means to this end, but I can't even accomplish these means without the grace that comes from this end. So I have to almost, to begin, I have to go to the end and see where am I going? And how do I have that grace necessary to accomplish this? So, yes, we have been given this great gift, which will get us to our end, but we need our end, Jesus Christ and His grace, to accomplish the law. Okay, And that's why Jesus will then say, love of God and love of neighbor is summed up, right? Um, it's the summary of all the law and the prophets because Christ is the center. He is the fulfillment. We cannot love God and we cannot love our neighbor without Christ. It's impossible. Okay? Um, so, how, how does this work? How does Christ help us to love God and love neighbor? When we look at this a little bit, we we'll just kind of put up our arrow here and then an arrow here. What do we know about Christ? Okay, we know that there's one God, three persons and one God. And then when we look at the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ, we see that Jesus Christ is one person, but he has two natures. So the two natures of Christ is the divinity okay, and his humanity. The more that I know and love his divinity, the more I know and love Christ's divinity, I want to have no preference to any other God. And we do have gods. We can try to fool ourselves and think that we don't have any other gods, but we do. Um, we have the gods of money. We have the gods of popularity. We have the gods, we make ourselves our own God. And so all of these gods, of course, are, are false gods, and so they're the gods with a small g. But we do have other gods, every one of us, whether we're rich or whether we're poor. Um, there's always a temptation. We can put our family before God, and therefore it becomes a god. We can put our work before God, and then it becomes a small g god. So we always have uh, the temptation to put other things, other people, before God. But this begins to change when we fall in love with Christ. And when we see His divinity, we understand and know and love His divinity. That truly, the, the closer I draw to Christ, that I begin to see, this is the Son of God. Truly, this is the Son of God. And the more we love that, we don't want to put anything above Him. Even our, even our spouse, even our family, even our kids, even our work, even good things, we don't want to put before Christ, because we understand now that He is the ultimate good. We will only know that when we start to see that His divinity. When we start to fall in love with His divinity, we will not want to take His name in vain, because we'll understand how holy it is. The holy name of Jesus, which every tongue should confess, every knee will bow, right? Um, and also, that, and this is very key, when we understand His divinity... We would never want to not worship Him, especially at the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass. When we have fallen in love with His divinity, we can't wait to worship. 
and to offer ourselves along with him to the Heavenly Father at Mass. What a great opportunity we have to do that um, in the Mass. Now, so, so even though Christ is our end, it is through a love of Christ, it's through this charity, a pure, good, and faithful charity, that we understand his divinity, and therefore we are wanting to obey this commandment out of love. Okay? There, there's, there's, um, there's a few motivations that we can have in life. I'll go ahead and write these over here. Um, and there's a few, few reasons we could be motivated. If, if I'm going to do something, I can be motivated out of, one, a fear. Okay? So, why, why, would, I, um, why would I decide to obey the Ten Commandments? Well, I, I fear hell, right? I'm afraid of hell. Why would a child obey a parent? Well, I'm afraid of a punishment. The second thing is, I want a reward. So I would obey the Ten Commandments because I want the reward of heaven. In the case of a child and a parent, the child would obey the parent uh, because they, they want a reward, maybe candy or, or something like that. But there's a better motivation. The most perfect motivation is simply love. Charity. Why does a child obey a parent? Because they love the parent. They want to please the parent. Um, not just out of fear or reward. And so when we look at this, why do we, why do we obey these commandments? Um, the best thing would be not because we fear hell or want heaven, even though those work. The best motivation is simply love. When we love Christ, when we have His charity, His pure, good, and faithful charity, it, and when we love Christ, we will want to then love Him in these ways. Love Him by loving Him first, and preferring Him first to all others, to cherish His holy name above all other names, and to worship Him, and make that worship the center of our lives. Okay. Now, how does this work in regards to His humanity? Well, we see that, that Jesus Christ is not only divine, but He's also human. And, and so, because He's human, we know that His image is in every other human. Because all humans are made in the image and likeness of God. Um, okay, so it says in Scripture that God emptied himself. Okay, he emptied himself taking the form of a slave. Right? He emptied himself and took on our humanity. Um, and we also know that humanity is made in his image. So there's this, um, there's this, of course, sharing that the divinity, Jesus Christ, God, has become man. Um, Therefore, he shows us what it means to be a perfect human. In his humanity, and the more we understand his humanity by looking at the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, when we see the Christ of the Gospels, we see perfect humanity. We see the perfect human, Jesus Christ, who is able to honor his mother and father, who is able to obey all of these commandments out of love of the Father, out of love of for, for other humans. And so the more we understand Him um, in His humanity, we see the perfection of His humanity, and then we see something we can imitate. Um, now that's going to be important, and we'll, we'll, we'll kind of talk about that word imitate. So I'll leave this up here for a second. And I just want to um, talk a little bit about the Trinity here. Um, so we'll talk about the Father and the Son. And we know that the Father is the lover, the Son is the beloved, and that the shared love between is the Holy Spirit. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons and one God. Um, now, the Son is not the image of the Father because the Son and the Father are one. They're consubstantial, right? The Son is consubstantial of the same substance, one in being with the Father. So the Son, it wouldn't be correct to say that the Son is an image of the Father because He is one with the Father in, in His substance. Now, we are the image of God, okay? The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit always were, but 
in his great love, the Father wanting to share his love with us, uh, that's his desire, is to share and to love. So he creates us, and we're made in the image of God, and he wants to share with us, he wants to share his divine life, okay, and he wants to love us. We're made in his image. This word image in Latin is imago. Okay, in English it's imitate. So it's kind of like the likeness and the similarity and a likeness of God. It's not that we are God, but that we are made in his likeness and that we are to imitate him. So you can see that as much as we can go two ways with this. Um, if we are to imitate God and we're made in His image, there's two ways we can go. We can either draw closer to Him, or we can go farther away. So we can become more like Him, or more in His image. Okay, Or we can become less like Him. Our whole goal, and it says this in the Catechism, you can look up the Catechism of the Catholic Church, uh, 221. The whole goal, we are destined to share in this eternal exchange of love. Okay, so we think of those words share and love. If, if, if I am made in the image and likeness of God, then I am made to imitate God. I am made to draw closer to that likeness. The closer I draw, the more I will share. And the more I will love. I'm going to share in that divine life. And I'm going to be able to share in that love. Not just sharing in the love of God, but sharing in the love of neighbor. Okay, and we'll get back just to a second to why do we love our neighbor anyways? What is, what is the reason we love our neighbor? It's a good question. But to come back here, if I am created to imitate God... All right, to love and to share in this divine life, the less I become like him, the more I move away in likeness to him, the less I will share. And the less I will love. Is there a point where we could have no share, right? Move into no share in this divine life. Yes, there is. Um, and, and the sad thing about that is, that is not what we're created for. We are created in the image and likeness of God. We are created to imitate, to become more like Him every day. But when we, through sin, choose to become less like Him, and we move away in that sharing, there is even a point where we, we could choose, of course, and this would be hell if it was a, a, a definite choice, um, then, then we could choose to not share in that divine life at all. Okay. On the other side of that, the other extreme is that a, a perfect sharing, an eternal sharing. An eternal share in this love. And, and this is where we're at. God has given that to us. God has enabled that to be perfect. The only reason we are made in the image and likeness of God is because God has deemed that. He wants us to be in His image, and He has created us that way, and so that's what we, that's what we do. Now here's back to the question. Um, of course, the, of course, since since Christ is the end of all of this, and it is Christ who purposely shows us how to love God and neighbor, the more that we share and imitate Christ, the more we imitate Christ, the more we will be able to love God, and the more we will be able to love our neighbor. Um, since these are the means to that end we can really show that through our love of Christ that we are living out the law um, through that grace of Christ that enables us to live out the law and to be an example and to be a witness. But why do we love our neighbor? And, th and this is a question of, for the Catholic, this question is very simple. Why do I love my neighbor? I love my neighbor because my neighbor is, is also in the image and likeness of God. So just as, think about this for a second, just as the Father loves the Son, 
he loves the son because uh, he is by nature love, all right? It's a personal relationship. And so he, he also loves the image. He loves us. We are in the image and likeness of God. He loves us as well, just like he loves the son. Um, he loves the, the image um, of God as well. Now, we love our neighbor. Maybe we may not even like our neighbor, but we're willing to love them because they're made in the image and likeness of God. Okay, and that's key. So we look to Mother Teresa, who may be one of the best examples of this. Mother Teresa took seriously um, the gospel, Matthew 25, where it said, the way that you treated the least of my brothers and sisters, Jesus said this, when you treated the least of my brothers and sisters, you did it to me. And she'd always use the gospel of the hand here. Five things. You did it to me. When you treated them a certain way, you did it to me. And, and that's key. We see Christ in our neighbor. And therefore, we love our neighbor because Christ is in them. Um, the image of, of God is in them. Um, okay? The, the other side of that is, so what if you're not Catholic? Well, I want to share a story first before I move into that. Um, Catherine of Siena is another example of this. Catherine of Siena, when she was, I believe, a teenager, and she was able to be of marrying age, um, her mother wanted her to marry a certain young man in the village. And, and Catherine did not want anything to do with marriage. She wanted to consecrate. She had already decided at an early age to consecrate her life um, to God and to be a consecrated virgin. And so when her mother was pressuring her to, um, to marry, she decided she had long, beautiful hair. She decided to cut her hair off. Well, her mother was furious, and her mother delayed the marriage. And, um, but also, in, in, in this action, her mother disciplined her, and, and, and Catherine was uh, made to be the servant of the family. And I think this lasted for, for quite a few months, even a year. So she was treated horribly. She was, um, she was basically the servant, the maid of the family. She had a small little room. She was to wait on the whole family until after they ate. They were to serve them all. Um, they would eat. She would clean up all the plates. And then she would get whatever food was left over. Well, one time the priest, the parish priest, came to their house. And he saw the way she was treated. And he asked her, Catherine, um, this isn't fair. This isn't just. What's going on here? And how do you put up with this for so long even by your own family? And her answer to the priest was, I see my mother as Mary, I see my father as Joseph, and I see my, sub my siblings as the baby Jesus. So she was able to get through this difficult time and she was able to do it in charity because she saw the image of God um, in her family. Even if, when the family was treating her wrong, she saw that in her neighbor... She treated them the way she would treat Mary, the way she would treat Joseph, the way she would treat Christ himself. And that is how we're trying to treat our neighbor, as if they were Christ. Um, I want to go ahead and, and just for a second, I was thinking about one other uh, analogy that might be helpful for this image of God. If, if you remember those, um, when we look at a coin, for instance, we take the penny. Okay, in the penny we have Abraham Lincoln, um, that, that is his image is on the penny. And we can, um, we can scrape that image, and we can distort that image, but we would still know that that penny was made in the image and likeness, okay? The image and likeness on that penny was Abraham Lincoln, okay? You can even go to a, a drastic um, example, and, and those little machines at the zoo and other different places uh, where tourists are, you can put a penny in the machine, you can put your two quarters in, and then you can um, kind of crank that thing, and it turns your penny, it smushes your penny down and makes it flat. And then it puts another image on it. And even if that takes place, even if you have a penny with Abraham Lincoln on it, and then you put it into that machine and it, and it makes a, a flat surface, and now your penny has the image of a zebra or a lion or something if you're at the zoo, you know what image was on that penny at the beginning. Um, even the kids know that at first that penny had another image on it. And, and you could still even, of course, take that copper, put it into the original mold, and have that penny again. And that's the case with this, this uh, Mago Dei, right? The, the image of God, um, the, the imitation of Christ. What we want to do is, we, we don't want to move in this direction, because what we do in this direction 
as we begin to, to tarnish, to scrape off that image in a sense, and even, and even put another image on it. Um, but we know, what's so sad about that is we know where we came from. Uh, we know that we do have the image and likeness of God. Um, so no matter how far someone goes, no matter how far they go, we know what their true image and likeness is, and that can be gained back. At least that can be gained back in this lifetime if we choose to repent. Um, on the other end, you know, we can try to keep that image polished and pure so that people can see very clearly um, who we are in the image and likeness of, which is, is God. Um, okay, so, um, so with all of that, um, we want to kind of go back to the question of why, for a Catholic, why do we love our neighbor? Because Christ is in our neighbor. But what about someone that is raised with uh, no faith? Okay, um, they're able to maybe uh, do these to honor their father and mother and to not kill or commit adultery or steal or lie. In fact, these are very uh, natural law things, right? Anyone can do these. It's a different story. Not anyone can do these. You have to have grace to do these. Um, to love God, their, their religion helps us to do that. You, you must really have religion to do these things. You have to have grace to do these things. You do not necessarily have to have religion to do this. Um, there have been societies that have done this, um, religion, of course, helps us to do that well, and grace helps us to do it well. But we see that all civilizations have had somewhat a structure of the love of neighbor. But why? Why do we love our neighbor? Why will one human maybe rescue another human out of icy water or, or in, in a dangerous situation? And, and, you know, this is a really good question to ask, and I don't know if there's, there's probably quite a few answers to this, but I think the deepest answer is that every human whether they believe in God or not, whether they're a religious person or not, every human knows innately that, that there is something deeper to us, that there's a respect to us, that there's a dignity to us. And when we say respect of life or the dignity of life or this intrinsic value that's part of us, what we're talking about here is the image of God. There is something in us. When, when, a, when, a, when a mother gives birth, what does she immediately want to do? She immediately wants to share and to love. Okay? Why does she want to share and love? Because God shares and love. And this mother, made in the image and likeness of God, already wants to share and love. What does that young child learn to do? That young child wants to share and to love, wants to reciprocate. You can almost already see the Trinity happening, right? Uh, because that mother and child... Uh, are made in the image and likeness of God, the mother, the lover, wants to share and to love. And, and the beloved, the child, wants to give that back, to reciprocate that back. And it's a very powerful thing. Um, the same thing is true of a husband and a wife. Um, and so innately, we are made in the image and likeness of God, even those who don't recognize Christ, who don't believe in God, um, and aren't religious people. There is something about that. Now, we can also see the reverse of that, which would be humans that are completely evil to each other. And what do we see when that happens? When we see examples of ISIS and, and just other um, uh, groups that are just, um, you know, we see Hitler, we see ISIS, we see um, people that will just destroy and kill, as, as we hear in the scripture, that Satan comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, these are satanic, you know, they're, they're influenced by Satan. And in this case... What does he hate? What does Satan hate? He hates the image of God. He wants nothing to do with the image of God. And so he wants to convince humans that another human does not have the image of God in them. And so he wants them annihilated, wiped out, as if they're just a piece of paper that you can crumble up and burn up and throw away. And we see this um, when we see abortion. We see that um, when we can look at another human, right, made in the image and likeness of God, who is in the protection of a mother's womb, that we can just say that is not a life. Or we can see assisted suicide or euthanasia. Any of these attacks against life, attacks against life are an attack against the image of God. And this is what Satan, the evil one, wants to do. Um, we have to really guard against this because what it really means to be human is to respect this dignity. Whether you're a faithful person or not, whether you believe in God or not, to be a good human 
is to respect the image and likeness of God in another human and be willing to follow these out of love of your neighbor. Why love of your neighbor? Because you know somehow, even innately, you know that they're made in the image and likeness of God. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the